Hi, I'm going to continue with the Network Systems mini lectures and we're going to start with the application layer. This forms the chapter 3 and without uh, wasting any further time, let's begin. It is humans who initiate communications. For example, this lady might be wanting to send a message. This gent over here might be uh, wanting to make a phone call. And this person over here might be doing an Excel spreadsheet. And all of these require protocols and an interface for the human to interface with the computer, be it your mobile phone, your desktop, your uh, PDA in the old days, whatever it is that you are requiring that needs to access a network, well, you will be interfacing through the application layer. Now, before we get into more detail, I will say that the application layer also deals with uh, software that does not access the network. For example, you might just want to watch a video. Maybe you've got Media Player Home Cinema or VLC Media Player or QuickTime, whatever it is that you're using to watch a video, and that too will be present in the application layer. The application layer is going to require certain services which run in the background, and this will allow us to achieve the goals that us as end users want to, uh, to enact while we interface with our devices. So watching a video, maybe not streaming a video, but actually watching a save video also will use the application layer. Okay. So if we're looking at the OSI model, we can see that our application layer is on the top, layer 7, and it is the primary uh, contact point for the end user and the computer. It also acts as an interface to the network. Now remember, I said in the uh, introductory lectures that through the physical layer, we actually, uh, when I say we, the computer or um, I'm going to use the word computer for all devices that access uh, the internet. The computer accesses the internet through the physical layer, but we don't access the internet through the physical layer. We cannot understand ones and zeros and we cannot transmit and receive on the physical layer. We do not know how to do that as end users. We need to deal with the application layer that gets the data in a format that we can understand. Right, so let's move along. Okay, so what is the role of application services and protocols in converting human communication that can be transferred across a data network? Now, as I said, the application layer allows the information to be in a human format. You might be doing an Excel spreadsheet. That is a human format. You might be browsing a web page. Again, a human format. So in the application layer, there is software that is installed to allow the human to uh, use the computer and make it much easier for us to in interact with. Remember, 20 odd years ago, most people were, were not... Uh, proficient at using computers. And if you go to like 30 years ago, most people were not computer literate. Computers were very complicated for the average user. There was a lot of DOS uh, software that was being uh, used. And you the, the applications that were available were not intuitive. And there were obviously limitations. So what has happened is software has become more and more complex. But in becoming more complex, it has become easier for us to use. So that's the, the goal. For example, in the old days, you would want to configure a, a router or a switch. You would have to do it through a, a console cable and log in to, uh, to a, a router's uh, port. But nowadays, you can do it using a GUI. That a GUI means a graphical user interface. And I'm sure many people who are watching this video have, uh, have tried to set up a router. And if you're using, say, the D-Link or uh, these popular routers, you just do it through a web page. Now that is making it easier for people to communicate with the device and that will happen on the application layer instead of us trying to access the information by short circuiting or kind of jumping across these layers. So the application layer is the layer which us as humans interact with. It prepares human communication for transmission across the network. Now let's look at some animation. Okay, so in this slide, we see a gentleman sitting here at his computer, and we want to 
he wants to interface with the network, meaning he wants to send a message or access a web server, for example. And this is what happens. Step one, uh, he will interface with his computer because he will maybe type on his keypad or maybe send a voice message, whatever it is, he's creating communication. Then that m information is uh, um, received by the software which converts it to digital communication. Remember that the, we interface mostly through an analog format. And the information has to be converted into digital, i.e. ones and zeros. No, not buns and zeros, ones and zeros. And this takes place in the application layer by the support of services which are running. And I'll get into what these services are shortly. Now, <clears throat> the application layer services initiate the data transfer. Now, after it is ready to be transferred, it then goes through these layers with each layer playing an important role. And through the series of these lectures, I'm going to tell you in detail what these layers are doing in order to prepare this um, form of communication for the communication or the network channel. So here is the person. He's ready to communicate. He interfaces with his software. So let's enact this. I have a website. Let's open this website. And let's go to uh, www.amazon. Now, what I'm doing is I am initiating communication by trying to access information from Amazon's server. But how did I do that? I had to type something into this, this web browser. And in doing that, I typed English words. So this is a type of software. This software is called a, a web browser. And there are many web browsers. And I like the Firefox one. But you might prefer Google Chrome or, or Internet Explorer and so forth. So you use software which then takes your communication and converts it into a digital format using um, various services and protocols. And then if you are trying to access something outside of your computer, well, this information needs to be prepared to be put onto a communication channel. And then the reverse of this happens when the uh, message has to come back to you or maybe a different form of that message. For example, here I was on Amazon's website, but do you recall that I first had to type in the website and then I got a web page um, populated in this blank space. So here we're seeing all the advertising coming through. These are messages coming back to me. If I say, uh, if I click on the this uh, little link here, messages are coming to me. I requested this information and here they come. Maybe I'm interested in this Anchor SD card slot reader, card reader. Well, if I click on it, the server at Amazon knows to provide me with this information. So that means that information has to come back to me and therefore it goes all the way through these OSI layers back to me and it has to be put in a format that a human can understand and I stress this so much because people don't realize that computers don't speak English they don't speak they um, although I have had this argument about uh, computers speaking on a network well I don't like to use the word speak because speak kind of uh, links to the verbal nature of um, of human activity but computers transfer and receive information and this happens in computer language or binary and binary is ones and zeros binary is not an anchor memory uh, a sd uh, a card reader but this sd card reader can be represented in binary so let's move on okay if we compare the osi model to the tcpip model you can see that the application layer on in the TCP RP model uh, really consists of three of the OSI layer layers. Here they have the application, presentation, and session. So in the OSI world, each one of these layers can be described individually, with each one having a defined function. While in the TCRP model, 
the application accounts for all three of these. Now, in this short uh, uh, lecture, um, I'm only going to discuss the application layer itself. I'm just sh uh, showing you the comparison to the TCP IP model. Okay, so when we talk about the application layer, we also look at protocols. And protocols are very important for us to uh, reach the goals that we want. Now, in this slide, you can see there are various servers connected to this router. Now, what are these servers? We've got a DNS server, a Telnet server, an email server, DHCP server, web server, FTP server. Okay, so I'll briefly just tell you what these are. A DNS server is a domain name server. It provides us with the ability to know uh, web sites on the internet. For example, I don't know if you recall, just, uh, just recently I did this www.amazon.com. Now let's do that again, www.amazon. Now www.amazon.com is an IP address. It's a word that is easy for humans to understand because it's a name of a company, but it actually is an IP address. Because the server at Amazon, or, or sorry, the uh, server farm at Amazon uh, will respond to any queries that are coming through on Amazon's specific public IP address. Now, a lot of these terms may be brand new to you. For example, why did I use the word public IP address and why is that different to private IP address. Now, a public IP address is an IP address that the world can see, usually an IP address which is not changed very often. Uh, Amazon has a group of public IP addresses and most of the companies that you deal with have public IP addresses because if you're going to access those companies over a web browser, you need to know their address. Yes, their address because just like sending post, the, the, the post office, the postman or woman needs to know where the letter is going. Well, the same as the web browser. If I say www.amazon.com, where is that? Well, it has to be converted into an address. And the address that we use on the internet is called IP version 4 and in brackets IP version 6. Now, IP version 4 in terms of the web browser can be found by using something called a NS lookup and I'll show you that in a second. Now amazon.com has an IP address. So when I say www.amazon.com and I hit the go button what is happening is my web browser if it doesn't already know maybe it's a site I've never been to has to go and find that IP address and the group of server or cluster of servers that assists in your web browser finding the IP address, well, that is called a DNS server. Now, you can try this. If you uh, load Amazon.com on your computer, you'll see it'll load very quickly. Look, and the reason is, is because it's a, the, web, um, the IP address has already been stored in my web browser's cache. But if I go to a web page that I've never been before, maybe there's, uh, let's just say, I don't know if there is an Amazon.co.za, but I've never been there. So if I click it, it should take quite a while to load such a page. You see, now what is happening is the um, what is happening is my web browser is looking for Amazon.co.za, and that is probably an unknown address to my web browser. My web browser does not know of that address. So it is querying a cluster of DNS servers. That means that on the internet, there is a group of DNS servers in every country, by the way, and in every continent. For example, you can go to public DNS server list, um, public-dns.info, and you can find all the DNS servers in your local country. So because I did .co.za, that would be in South Africa. So that means that if I wanted to see the DNS servers in South Africa, here they are. These are the DNS servers. That means that your web browser, if it cannot, if it does not know www.amazon.co.za, it has to query a 
DNS server, which is a friendly server on the internet, and this server has to reply and say, "Hi," uh, and I'm 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 talking as though the the uh, DNS server is is speaking. I'm I'm almost giving it a human uh, feature. I'm saying the web browser will respond and say, "Okay, if you're looking for." Sorry, the DNS server will respond and say, okay, if you're looking for www.amazon.co.za, you need to go to this IP address. So it replies with an IP address. And then the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, web browser then uses that IP address to find the um, server. Now, in this case, you can see there is no .co.za and that's why it took so long. So let's try another website that I have never been to for a very long time or I've never been to zest.com. I think they make gym equipment. So I've never been here. So let's see what happens. You can see again it is taking quite long and if you compare it to the um, Amazon website you can see that the Zest it took much longer. Now I see it's not gym equipment. It happens to be some beauty products. But nevertheless, Zest.com is a website I've never been to before. And that is why it took longer to load. Now, if you want to know Zest.com's IP address, you can just go and press CMD to get the command prompt. And you can say NS lookup www.zest.com. And what you're doing is you are querying to find out what is the IP address of Zest.com. And there it is. The public address is 35196981162. Okay, so I know I'm giving you a lot of information at once here. So we can recap afterwards. But let's move on to the other features or other servers that are available. So this is the DNS server, which I am going to revisit. Okay. So this is a friendly server on the internet. And then there's other servers. For example, your email server. You might have uh, run uh, Microsoft Exchange. Maybe you use Outlook. Well, it needs to interface with a server on the internet. Well, there is the server providing a certain uh, service to you via various protocols. You, there might be a DHCP server which you um, use. And if you're wondering what DHCP does, it provides you with an IP address when you log into a network. If you did not set your own uh, IP address or if there is a rule in your organization where the server provides you with an IP address, well, guess what? That is a little process running on the server and it is called a DHCP process or uh, a protocol. And that is the DHCP server. It need not be an entire server. The DHCP, uh, I don't want to say DHCP protocol because the P contains the word protocol within it. But the DHCP could be on a server which could also be your web server. Or it could also be your email server. So these can be clustered into one server. All right, let's look at some animation. Now, earlier I said that the application layer uses services. Now, I'm sure you're very familiar with the task manager. If you click it, you should get this type of window. And what you'll see is this uh, tab here called services. Now, these are all the services which are running in order for my, my computer to, to actually function. Now, you'll see that there are plenty of services running and if you could not find a computer on a network for example well guess what there was a service that was not running if you could not print well there's a print spooler which was not running so these are all the services that support the application layer software now keep in mind that the application layer we do not interface directly with the application layer the software which we use on our computer maybe we're using coral draw maybe we're using microsoft excel maybe we're using word this is the applications which we use which interface with the application layer so there is some confusion there although not very important uh, many uh, people think that they're using the application layer directly well not really we install the software which is installed into the application layer, but we use the software. You, you get that. So I, if I want to use Outlook, there is Outlook. It is an application installed in the application layer. 
So the front end for me is the application software. Okay. So we need the software to be installed. But, but, you know, that's the point of departure here. We have to have the software. And these services support all those softwares. Okay. There's an application, excel.exe. And there's a service. The process that runs in order for Excel to actually function. This is the back end. The stuff that we do not necessarily have access to uh, unless you're doing uh, programming. Okay, and then we see the system operations. These are additional activities which are running in order for us to reach our goals. And then you might find that there are many of the same services running. And each one has its own process. Okay, so let's recap. We create, uh, we initiate communication. We use software through our devices. These devices are supported by services. These services allow this communication to be put into a format that computers can deal with. This information is then transferred onto a network. In order for it to get onto a network, it has to go through a, very, a various set of um, stages that prepare the communication by providing error information error you know in terms of error corrections addressing and so forth now looking at the protocols which are present in the application layer we have protocols by the way for every layer there are a set of rules for the physical layer for example if you want to get light signals onto a fiber optic cable you need a set of rules or protocols. There are rules for the data link layer. There are rules for the network layer. IP has a set of rules and protocols. Well, that's what a protocol is. It's a, it's a, type of, uh, it's a set of rules. Transport layer has a set of rules. Session, presentation. Well, we are talking about protocols on the application layer. So as you become a specialist in the field of networking, you'll realize that networkers no protocols you understand all the different rules that apply for each layer of the osi um, system so in terms of the application layer protocols define the processes on either end of the communication the types of messages are you sending voice are you sending text are you sending video they define the syntax of messages they define the meaning of any information fields and they define how messages are sent and the expected responses and they prepare it for the next layer now this is a bit uh, general because this is almost true for all of these layers by the way all right moving on we now come to the client server model now as a client we generally require service from servers now let's not get confused here there are services running on your computer as i showed you and then there are servers which are computers maybe on your local network or in the cloud on the internet which provide you with service so maybe you require a web page well the server will provide you with that information, providing a service to you outside of your computer. Now, you as the client will need to upload or download or both. Now, when you do your networking, you'll see that the upload rate and the download rate tend to be pretty different. Here, I've done a speed test just showing how on my own link at my own uh, office, I have a download speed of 35 megabits per second but look at the upload only three and a half and the reason is because we generally download more than we upload and the reason for that is we require service from the servers if that was not clear let me say it a different way we require information from the internet we are getting information from various servers who are providing us with this information so we mostly downloading and less frequently 
uploading. And that is why the download speed is usually much higher than the upload speed. If you look at your uh, data usage, you will see that most of it, maybe 90%, is downloaded rather than upload. So as a networking engineer, you will see that it is more feasible to have faster uh, download than upload. But there are scenarios where you would need both. For example, if you are a company providing services to a host of clients, well, then you would need to have a very fast upload speed, allowing your uh, information from your service to leave the network as fast as possible. So as end users, we need download speed faster than upload speed. But if you are a company providing service, maybe a online store, well, then you would need a equally fast upload speed. Okay, so just uh, defining that for you. Now, when we download, we are taking information or requesting information that is stored somewhere else, not on our computer. And when we upload, we are taking information that is stored locally on the client, on your own PC or phone or whatever it is, and you are sending it somewhere else. Now, in order for this process of uploading and downloading to take place, we need common application layer services and protocols. That means if you are trying to log in to a server using a certain protocol, maybe you're using something called Telnet. Telnet is a type of protocol that allows you to have remote logins via, via a terminal uh, and it's very it's not safe at all. It allows you to log in to a server or router in real time. But in order for this to happen, that same protocol has to be present on the server. So what will happen is maybe you used, in the old days, we used something called TerraTerm. This is a terminal software which allows us to connect to a uh, server or router on the network. And what would happen is we would log in using a command prompt. When I say command prompt, I mean a window that, that looks something like that. So that's the what it would look like. You would say telnet and you would put your address of your router. Uh, but you would use a terminal software to do that. And it would be text-based. So it would only work if the router or server or device on the other side also has telnet. For example, if you are trying to access Amazon's web page, for example, you want to do a purchase and you use HT, HTTP, well, Amazon's web, uh, web server will also have to have HTTP enabled. Otherwise, we cannot communicate. So this, the point of the slide is to say that we need common application layer services. It doesn't help for client 1 to have Telnet, client 2 to have a protocol called SSH, and then the server they're trying to access has neither. Because then it's like this person speaks English, this person speaks Russian, and this server here speaks Greek. Nobody can understand anybody. So this is why these um, protocols have to be common. And that is why when you have uh, the uh, OSI uh, model, we try and use it as a general uh, uh, model that is applicable everywhere. In the older days, we used to have these printers connected to our local computers. And they were connected just via a USB cable. So the printer was literally plugged into the neighboring computer. And maybe it was sitting on the secretary's desk or something like that. And if you wanted to print, maybe you were computer 2 or you were computer 3, you had to print via computer 4. So that meant that computer 4 had to be on. If computer 4 was not on, then you could not see printer C. You couldn't print to printer C because you were actually printing through computer 4 who was acting as a print server. So in this case, a regular computer can offer other um, computers on a network the option of a server. You see, this computer 4 is acting as a print server for all the other computers who may want to print through printer C. So that is how simple a computer can be converted to a server. As I tried to explain, the idea of server means you accessing it for services. So computer 2 and 3 are accessing computer 4 for services of 
printing. And here we see printer A. Maybe this is a different type of printer. Maybe you're printing pay slips or, or, or large format printing. And it's connected via computer 1. Maybe this is in a print lab. Then if you are sitting on computer 3 and you need to do fancy printing, well, then you will have to print through computer 1. Computer 1 will have the printer software and it will be running all the time. If it is not, if computer 1 goes offline, well, then you will not be able to print to printer A. And an improvement on this model was the TCP IP printer, which means that the printer itself has an Ethernet connection, its own IP address, and it becomes its own node in the network, which means you print directly to it. It acts as its, it, you, it acts as its own server. So these printers, or then usually use Ethernet, they could also be wireless, but the point is, is they do not require a standalone uh, computer next to it that will provide it with the uh, server option. So in the old days we used to get these things and we used to connect them to our printers and they acted as what we call a printer server and then it would stop this problem of having a printer connected to a computer and then the computer was off or the somebody or, or there was a, that, that person uh, um, we would try to print and then this person's computer had to be constantly checked because you would press print and then it wouldn't print then you'd have to go to this computer to go and see what is going on what's going on in the print queue maybe the print spool isn't working now these are the old problems that we used to have but even in large organizations we might still have a print server especially in a university or things like that where we're looking at access control and then when you do print it will be managed by an entire print server. So it, I'm not saying that print servers are a thing of the past. I'm just saying that in smaller uh, offices, well, we don't really use this setup anymore unless it's those very large com um, printers, large format printers. It might still be connected to a local computer. But in a large organization, we... Uh, we might still use this print server. Here we might have an array of printers which are connected, even if they're connected by Ethernet, but they are managed by a server which looks at whether you how many prints you can make, whether you are authenticated on the network and so forth, and which printers you're allowed to print to because you will then try and print and it'll only let you see maybe the fifth floor printers while you're uh, uh, um, on the fourth floor, then you would have to get permission to see the fifth floor printers and things like that. So this is a larger setup where we have an actual server for this process. Okay, let's look at a different model. Instead of the client server, let's look at the peer-to-peer -peer model. Now, just to recap, uh, before we go to that, the client server model is here. You're here and you're accessing information from the server and the server provides you with that. So here we see I did the, um, uh, I went to zest.com or I went to Amazon. The Amazon is the server and I'm the client and I'm accessing service from the, uh, the, the Amazon server. Okay, so that's client server. The server is a single, or, or, or let's, I, I don't want to say single entity, but it is, I'm not accessing another client. When I do my online shopping, for example, when I'm looking at this Anchor uh, um, device, somebody else who's on Amazon's website cannot see me looking at this Anchor device. They're doing their own shopping, and they might be looking at this uh, card reader, but we're not seeing each other. And that's the point, is that it's separate. So when we're looking at the different models, we have the client-server model, which is, tends to be um, probably the most popular. It is independent from other clients. Right, now let's go back to the PowerPoint. When we look at a different model, it is called peer-to-peer -peer model. Now, I don't know if any of you remember in the old days, there was a website called Napster. Now, Napster used to allow end users to share music. And this was actually the, the, uh, a very contentious issue in terms of copyright infringement. And I know that Metallica band took Napster to court and I think they actually won. Well, you can look at that. And the reason why this was a copyright infringement was because people... <clears throat> excuse me, I could buy a Metallica CD 
and then I could share it with other people on the network, and then they could share it, and they could share it. So I was also acting as a server, but also a client. So this became a peer-to-peer process, meaning that both clients initiate a message and receive a message, and both clients simultaneously send and receive. So we're taking the process, we're taking the role of client and server. And that is uh, a very common protocol. Here we see, I'm sure a lot of you have been to this web page called the Pirate Bay, or maybe you've been to Kickass Torrents, whatever it is, Torrent Reactor, and maybe you search for a torrent. So here we go, maybe you're interested in the show called Botched. Now I just do this for explanation purposes. <coughs> Excuse me. So you might click here and you want to download the torrent. Well, when you do, you would need a torrent software. Here we go. I have BitTorrent installed for this uh, explanation. And I have loaded up some downloads uh, to demonstrate a peer-to-peer -peer network. So what happens is maybe I want to watch episode 17 from season 4. Can you see there's a list of peers here? I am actually getting the little packets or um, I'm getting packets or parts of this complete uh, uh, um, episode from these people on the internet. Now look at the different countries. And if I look at another one, uh, here we go. You can see here there's the addresses, IP addresses. Here's some more. So these people already have this episode and they are sharing it with me. And as I download, I am too sharing it with other people because you can see that uploads are taking place. So as I get a certain fragment of the uh, episode, I am now a server to others who want that same fragment. Therefore, I am taking the role of client because I, I need the, 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 the files. And server, because I have some of the files and I'm sharing with other people. Right, and this happens to be a very fast way to share information. And obviously has the copyright infringements uh, as a side effect. Because if I have downloaded this episode called number 18, I'm effectively uh, allowing others to copy this episode from me. Which means I'm making multiple, or, or I am enabling the process of multiple copies to take place. All right, I don't want to get into that argument. Um, let's just carry on. Now, this peer-to-peer -peer service uses something called the Nutella protocol. And this is a diagram just showing how it works. Nutella allows peer-to-peer -peer applications to search for shared resources on peers. Now, we, we were earlier on the PowerPay's Website. Now, what people don't understand and why uh, the Pirate Bay is, is, uh, is still around, and also because the, um, the guys who started it are very resilient, but not only that, they don't store any of this information. If you're looking for this show called Botched Season 1, Episode 6, Boob Freak, well, guess what? It ain't on the Pirate Bay's server. In fact, in the movie... Uh, part Bay, I think it's away from keyboard. Uh, the they said that they can store the entire directory on a thumb drive, so less than like 32 gigs. So if you're trying to accuse the Pirate Bay for 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 copyright infringement, it's a very difficult case to win because they are not actually copying anything; they are literally pointing you to people who have the information okay so here we go in terms of the napster case maybe i've got a cd and i've downloaded a band called britney spears okay why would i do that let's say i've got the metallica and then i now have a certain song and it's on my computer so i can tell a search engine 
that I've got it and I'm prepared to share it. Well, then if all these people have that same search engine, well, then they could uh, be notified that I hold the song and I could be sharing it with all these people. And when he's got it, he could then share it with these people and so forth as this exponentially multiplies. Haha. -ha. And why this actually took place is because at the time of Napster, we moved away from WAV files. And those of you who know about acoustics will know that a WAV file is a large audio file, while an MP3 is a condensed file. And the MP3 file maybe is, say, 4 megs, where the, where the equivalent WAV file is 40 megs. So in the time of Napster, the internet was still very slow and people didn't have a lot of bandwidth and data. <clears throat> Well, people weren't readily able to download 40 meg files, but a 3 meg uh, byte, uh, a 3 meg um, song w was much easier to share than a 40 meg song. So this is how this thing uh, actually exploded because of file sizes and MP3 coming up as a viable um, compression format. Right, uh, I did leave out something and I want to just go back to that. <coughs> I want to come back to the DNS service. Now, earlier I was describing the DNS service, and I know it can be confusing because we have not done the IP addressing yet, but I'd just like to explain this one more time because this will keep coming up in your uh, network's career. Every time you need to access a, a web server, for instance, www.cisco.com, it has to be converted into an IP address because the internet communicates via IP addresses. The internet does not communicate in cisco.com, amazon.com, zest.com. It doesn't communicate in English. It communicates via addresses converted to binary. So the addresses tell our web browsers where to go. And that's where the routing comes in, which we will come to later. The routing knows, the routers know, okay, if you're looking for 198.133.219.25, you've got to go to this country via this router into this state, into this ISP, because this is the address. In the same way you send a letter to someone, you might say the letter is addressed to number one, Main Avenue, Michigan, uh, United States. So when the letter leaves Germany, the first thing they're going to look at is the zip code and they say, okay, United States. So they know, okay, the first letter here is the first number here is telling me at least in which geographical location I'm going to, and then maybe which ISP I'm going to, and so forth. So in the same way that we use the um, address system in the postal system while well, the IP address system offers a similar feature and there is only one uh, a unique address called www.cisco.com in the same way there is only one address called and I'm going to find it right now right and I don't know how accurate this uh, website is but according to uh, ecorporateoffices.com if you want to go to Amazon's corporate office their physical address you would be going to 410 Terry Avenue North Seattle Washington and that's the code so what I'm trying to highlight to you is there is only one address called 410 Terry Avenue North Seattle Washington uh, and with a zip code if you put this into Google Maps you will get only one location and there it is you see if you go to MapQuest it'll take you to that single location there can't be another place called 410 Terry Avenue blah 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 it can't be so this is a unique physical address and that's the same as the IP address here www.cisco.com goes to this address I don't think this is the correct address but if it's 198-133-219-25 that is a unique address that nobody else on the internet may use that is it it is called a public IP address now the person the company the group that has all these addresses well that would be IANA and if you're wondering who IANA is this is the Internet Assigned Network Authority, who has all the addresses. And if you want to, want to see what it looks like, you can go to iana.org and they know all the domain names and addresses of all these companies. 
So if, uh, if I decide to have a website, my own website, I'll have to register it with IANA. But in my case, it won't be IANA Direct because it'll be dependent on my location. For example, IANA might be the global uh, uh, company, but mine would be AfriNIC because I'm sitting in Africa, which is the African branch. And they will then be the person who's going to provide my web page or my company with a website uh, address, with an IP address. So in each continent, you will find there's an overseeing body who's in charge of giving out these IP addresses. So if you want to have open your own online shopping uh, company, you would have to register a web page, a website, and then you would have to get an IP address, which is assigned to you. In my case, it's assigned by AfriNIC because I'm sitting on the African continent. Okay, so somebody, some company, uh, probably Iona, gave Cisco their IP address or, or assigned it. And obviously, it's not. I don't want to say gave. You don't own it. You 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 um you rent it or you lease it. And while you pay your membership fees and your domain name hosting fees, you are allowed to use that IP address. But the point of the story is that you, this IP address is something that is public. If we did not have this public IP address, nobody would be able to get to Cisco's website or Amazon's website, for example. Let's look at the animation. So here we have a DNS address resolution process. A client would like to access this, uh, not this, a client would like to access the internet and he has to first type in the name of the web page. In this case, it is cisco.com. So he types it in and what happens is this packet finds its way to the DNS server for a reason that it's in the um, uh, packet. It's got a certain flag that's set for the DNS server which knows uh, that a certain packet is coming through requesting a DNS response. And then the DNS looks at its table of IP addresses in the local area and it replies and says, oh, you're looking for www.cisco.com. The IP address is actually 198.133.219.25. Then what happens in the client's computer is that the web browser then uses that for the next communication. So this is what would happen. The client, never having gone to cisco.com before, sends out a request, a get request for the www.cisco's webpage. The DNS picks that up because the web browser sends a, another message actually prior asking for a <laughs> a name resolution, it needs to know who Cisco, so it needs the domain uh, name server to actually respond. And the domain name server responds to the client with the IP address. Then and only then does the web browser send a packet to uh, the correct uh, server in Cisco.com's uh, Cisco um, network, which might be over here. So the hop goes there, there, there. Okay. So when the DNS receives a query, the server looks at its own records to see if it can resolve the name. Can it resolve www.cisco.com into an IP address based on its own stored records? Remember that when you register a new IP address, it has to get registered with the DNS servers in your area. Otherwise, you will, uh, uh, your clients will not be able to find you on the internet. So the DNS server provides a very important function to allow the public to find these public IP addresses. Now, the DNS servers in, on the internet are set out according to the domain levels. Now, you might find it interesting to have a look at all the internet domain names or extensions. Here you see .com, .org, .net, int, edu, gov, mil. These tend to be uh, the US. But then we have the country codes. Here we see AC, 
AD. And you can go down this list. B. Bangladesh. BD. So if you're wondering why your country might be whatever your web page is called, www.soccer.co.br. BR is the Brazil code or extension. In the same way as we have the telephone system with a country calling code, well, we have that in the internet as well. .ca means Canada. And we have domain servers, domain name servers, which should feed certain geographical areas. And that is why I said that if you are in Djibouti, well, guess what? You're, you'll fall under Afrinik and so forth. If you are Algeria, well, you'll also form <coughs> under Afrinik because that is Africa. Okay, so that's what the domain name servers do. They resolve the domain name, the web address, into an IP address. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this section. And we'll continue with chapter 4 in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. Cheers.